Let's start with a very important reminder. Ireland's history was determined by its geographic location, which brings up the first quiz. You get five seconds to answer this. <laughs> How many people can find Ireland on the map? <laughs> Lots of people. Hello, my people are so brilliant. Here. There it is. It is the small island to the west of England, which is to the west of Europe. Those are the great critical moments, the great critical things to think about. And uh, west of Ireland, as they say in Ireland, the next parish is Boston. <laughs> 4,137 miles away. So Ireland is isolated from Europe, and it is England's backbone. Those two features control all the language. History. Quick quiz number two is Ireland big or smaller or the same size as Wisconsin? Five, four, three, two. You've got your answer locked in. It is smaller. Congratulations to those of you who got that. It is actually half the size of Wisconsin. Drop Ireland into Wisconsin and you have a lot of Wisconsin left over. If you want to compare Ireland to other states, it's the same size as West Virginia. Think about that. Think about that through this whole program. We're talking about an island in the Atlantic half the size of Wisconsin. Here. And it is divided into two countries, totally separate countries. Ireland, pronounced the Ireland Irish, and Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom. Different governments, different currency, different laws. If you go from Dublin up to Belfast, it's like driving from Green Bay to Milwaukee. And when you get to Oshkosh, about there at the border, you put away your euros and take out your pound sterling in order to buy anything. And if you're on your way to get an abortion, turn back. <laughs> the rules and the laws are better in Ireland than in Northern Ireland. Think about that. And drive faster when you're in Southern Ireland, you can go 100 kilometers an hour. When you hit that border, you're down to 60 miles per hour. The speed limit shifts. That part is like two and a quarter miles yeah. slower in Ireland. And they have very, very different flags. The Union Jack, of course, up in north. And in Ireland, you have the tribe color there with the colors reflecting the history of Ireland and the great hope of Ireland. Green represents Southern Ireland, orange represents Northern Ireland, for reasons we'll talk about later in the course, and the white represents peace with the great hope that someday that flag will turn to green and look like that, that there will only be one country, Ireland, on the island of Ireland. Here's a very, very famous song about the division. It's called Four Green Fields. The song is narrated or sung Partly by Mali, our vocalist, but uh, literally it's the goddess Eru who is narrating the poem and the song, uh, and the name Ireland comes from that goddess. Ireland is Eru's land, uh, and she is traditionally pictured as very young when times are good. Ah, uh, those were the good old days. They're gone. Now she's old and angry. Here's four green fields. Mother Ireland's lament for her lost province, Ireland, up northern Ireland, up in the north.
summary of Irish history. Reminder number two, then. This is a small, far off divided island, but it's uniquely famous. Get out of your way again, sorry. 20, think about this, half the size of Wisconsin. 23 U.S. presidents have had Irish heritage, including Barack Obama, and of course right now Biden, very, very Irish. One out of 10 Americans have Irish roots. I would try that with you, but Green Bay is notoriously for not meeting the average. Uh, but how many people here have Irish roots? It's just, oh my God. <laughs> how many of you would like to come up and give this lecture? <laughs> wow, that's fabulous. Holy smoke. Uh, and of course, as you all know, that worldwide celebrations on St. Pat, just think of half the size of Wisconsin. And if you've ever been to New York, five hour long parade million spectator and that's all across it's not just in america moscow has a st patrick's day parade there are, that's, there are parades in china the fun place to go when you're from green bay is go 40 miles what is that west to new dublin where they new to london where they changed the name to new dublin for the week before st patrick's day had a terrific celebration and of course, Green Bay has a Shamrock Club putting on a wonderful parade. And people on these occasions wear the most incredible, elaborate costumes, better than pack games, by the time they on the phone telephone, and they do weird things to their hair. They dress up their dogs, they dress up their cats, they dress up their horse, they dye the river green, they dye their food green. And the most amazing thing to me when you think about half the size of Wisconsin and within an hour's drive, there are four year-round Irish gift shops. So far you have to drive to find a German gift shop open year-round, <laughs> French or Belgian or Wallon. Or, I mean, just think that. I mean, one of them is wonderful. One up in Fish Creek, population 796, and they have a year-round Irish gift shop. Well, there, that is wonderful. Uh, and of course, at those gift shops, you have high quality goods made in Ireland. But around St. Patrick's Day, you can go to Walmart or Walgreens or anywhere and find an incredible amount of crap. No, kitsch. <laughs> kitsch. Uh, I mean, can you find flip flops that print proud to be Polish? Probably <laughs> not, but you can on St. Patrick's Day there. And year uh, <laughs> round, who uh, knew Jesus was Irish? <laughs> and bathroom sets there, like that. Ready for the next quiz question? Oh, oh, what bathroom item still needs to be Irish? Did you get it? There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, you can't find Polish toilet paper. <laughs> and third, very major important, this is key to this class in particular, most traditional Irish music was composed by four people who lived in cottages like this. Thatched roof, stone walls, dirt floor, and inside, hardly room for the four barefoot kids. There, can you see that? Or for their pigs. Not less for giant musical instruments uh, of any kind. Whoa. What do they do? Oh, there we go. When you think of Russian music, you think of those great ballets, Swan Lake, Nutcracker. Think of Italian music, you think of those great operas. Think of German music and every giant orchestra hall, giant orchestras, everybody formally dressed. Think of Irish music, and that's what you have. You're in a pub, you've got a beer, and it's a very small group playing very small instruments. And uh, we're playing jigs and reels for dancing, like St. Anne's Reel, and the band just played a medical. I'm going to go in songs about Irish history, like Four Green Fields. And the names of the Irish tunes even often reflect Irish life. The band is going to play a jig. It is not titled Dance of the Shepherd Plum Fairies or Concerto in C Major, and it's not the triumphal chorus from Aida. Can you name this? Irish washer. It's a domestic shirt. Washer washer. Who said that? <laughs> Who gave it away? <laughs> Stu Moore. Head of the class. <laughs>
point number one here. Uh, 432 AD, St. Patrick returns to Ireland, bringing Christianity and literacy to Ireland. Uh, before he got there, of course, there were the Celts, the native Irish that were spread all over the Western world. There were the Celts in the great world conquerors, which we hardly ever hear of because they had no written language and they had no central government. What they had were tribal communities, something like American Indians, in fact, uh, with a very common culture and related languages and non-Christian uh, religions. And they were a fierce warrior culture and did everything possible to make themselves look fierce. Some tribes fought nude, except for that ornamental band around the neck, <laughs> the torque. Uh, there. If Heritage Hill calls and asks you to volunteer for it, <laughs> you, you may want to think twice. Uh, they also spiked their hair to make themselves look taller and more fierce. If you remember Phyllis George, she had a wonderful Celtic hair. You know, and they painted and tattooed their bodies elaborately, and they cut the heads off of their uh, enemies. These are some tribes, remember? It's a huge collection of various tribes. That Irish reputation for fighting lives on. We're all familiar with the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. Think about it. And you can buy Fighting Irish t shirts of various kinds of anywhere. And if you watch the Oscars this year, I just about fell out of my chair uh, when Jimmy Kimmel uh, came out and told that you remember 2022 with the slap and all of that. Right there, he's playing off of that. Jimmy Kimmel, five Irish actors are nominated tonight, which means the odds of another fight on stage. <laughs> <laughs> he, he got a lot of flack. Uh, uh, but it's that fighting Irish image. Quick quiz what's Ireland's official national sport? Is it rugby, hurling, Gaelic football, or wrestling? All very physical, brutal sports. Five, four, three, hurling. It's hurling. It goes back 3,000 years to the ancient Celts, and uh, it was originally they didn't have a ball; they used the skull. Enemies there, and it is still today a very brutal sport. They have just now passed a regulation that everybody has to wear a helmet, but up until about two years ago, they did not do that. The great Celtic Empire disappeared. Uh, around 60 BC with Julius Caesar, with the Romans coming in, wiping out um, Celtic culture almost everywhere, and perhaps because they were better known, and of course, far more organized uh, than the Celts. But they did not get up here to the top of Scotland. Those of you who have been to England have seen Hadrian's Wall, the stopping point. Uh, for the Roman invasions, and Ireland totally untouched. We're back to that first point, geography determines history. This is, Ireland is a bridge too far, or an island too far, or whatever, uh, off there. So Europe totally gets conquered by the Romans. Britain, Lower Britain, Ireland remains Celtic. Uh, Romans change everything, but not. In Ireland. So in 402 AD, into Ireland comes Ireland's most famous immigrant arriving in pagan Celtic Ireland, coming as a slave to the surprise of many people. St. Patrick was not Irish by birth, he was a Roman Briton somewhere over there in perhaps what is now Wales. He was kidnapped by Irish raiders going over there who brought him back as a slave. He was 16 at the time, and his name wasn't Patrick at the time. It seems to have been Maywin Suckett. We could be celebrating St. Suckett's Day. <laughs> <laughs> he was taken up north into Northern Ireland where he herded sheep as an Irish slave for six years. Then, kind of miraculously, he made an escape from Ireland, fled to Europe where he became a priest and then a bishop, and then in 432 returned to Ireland with his new name, Patrick, and determined to convert 
the pagan Irish. Uh, some of the pagan Irish put up a fight and tried to assassinate him, sending out teams of assassins, fearing he would take their power. Um, but uh, there is a wonderful legend that he was saved by chanting St. Patrick's Breastplate, the piece of armor that saved him, which was a poem or a song that he chanted as he walked across Ireland and it made him invisible and all of the assassins saw was a deer. And this got turned into a wonderful, very brief, simple song back in the 1930s by a woman in England who sent it to a 300 year old Celtic tune, lovely tune, and it became a great hit song and a kind of a hymn in church. Do you remember Cat Stevens? Yes. Rock star kind of thing. Here's Brianna with Morning as well. Matthew chapter 30, verse 12. Those who are not with us 
And it is a fact that the Irish did, in fact, invent whiskey. Uh, whiskey was known, it, it was invented there by Irish monks in the 11th and 12th century, and it was a medicinal brew at the time, and it was given the name in Irish Ishkabaha, and that word Ishka eventually turned into whiskey. So we have that word. And the Irish monks did save civilization among all their other achievements. There's a wonderful book called uh, How the Irish Saved Civilization by Thomas detailing uh, what they did to save civilization and essentially the uh, message is that the barbarians, the Roman Empire collapsed, barbarians came spreading across Europe, burning libraries, wiping out learning and science and all knowledge kind of came to a stop for a couple of hundred years, but way off out there again, away from Europe, west of England, is this island protected then by all of that water, and Ireland is untouched by the Dark Ages. And they've had St. Patrick bringing rain there. So throughout the so-called Dark Ages, Ireland becomes this peaceful isle of saints and scholars, thanks to their vocation and to the monks of St. Patrick from it. There were at one point 550 monasteries uh, in Ireland spread all over little places like that with the monks in those cells. And what were they doing? They were copying manuscripts. <laughs> uh, and those of you who have been there, I hope, have visited places like Glendalock and Clemplum Mountains and Skelly Michael with their beehive huts. And perhaps even Kells Monastery, where the famous Book of Kells was found, the most, one of the most, certainly most famous literary work in uh, Ireland and a great national treasure. People stand in line for hours to get into Trinity College Library to see just a couple of pages of the book of Kells. It's the 340 page New Testament in Latin uh, with incredible elaborate calligraphy and elaborate decorations uh, throughout. Uh, it's just I mean, any picture. It is, it's from the 800 picture a monk in a little hut with a quill pen and little vegetable inks doing this incredible work and deciding, oh, I think I'll put on here. Where's my, I think I'll have a monk up here. This is a blow up of that. Here's a monk drinking wine over there. And the imagination of these people and the capital letters the abbot comes and says, I want you to work on the capital M today for this work meeting. <laughs> no, no one. Um, and he oh, comes, where'd he go? Oh, sorry. And he's up there and he said, oh, I think I'll draw a couple of guys in leotards having a beard pulling contest <laughs> while this other guy is doing, holding them all up. I mean, this looks like America's Got Talent show. <laughs> something happening now. I don't know why I'm losing that, sorry. And any, anyone with Celtic tattoos has probably taken them for the Book of Kells. And if you're familiar with Irish dance, there's all those elaborate decorations on their costumes come right out of the Book of Kells. So St. Patrick and his writing leaves behind this great literary history, the heritage of Ireland. And Ireland is famous for its writers, four Nobel Prize awards in literature, plus James Joyce, who died before he could get the Nobel Prize. Quick quiz, how many Wisconsin writers, twice the size of Ireland, have won the Nobel Prize in literature? Ireland has won four. Yeah. Trick question. <laughs> Absolutely. How many Nobel Prizes in literature for all of the United States? 140 times bigger than Ireland. Is it 312 or 139? Twelve. No, you're right. No, it's just three. Think about that. Half the size of Wisconsin. Four prizes in literature for the tiny little island in the Atlantic. Ireland even has a popular birch form named for a county 
What's that time? Stewart probably knows. Yes, Wimmer. Yes, Smart guy. It's all set in front of him. <laughs> yes, Limerick. And you're all familiar with limericks like this one. A swimmer whose clothing was strewed by winds that left her quite nude saw a man come along. And unless I am wrong, you expected this line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, turning point number three, Brian Maru, King of Bite Ireland, defeats the Vikings at the Battle of Clonter, Good Friday, 1014. Quick flashback in history, in 795, the Vikings came over and invaded Ireland, coming first as raiders, plundering all those monasteries of all of their gold chalices and things like that. And then they said, oh, warmer in Ireland than in Scandinavia, let's settle in here. And they start settling in, and they are the ones who establish all of Ireland's major towns. Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Wexford, Waterford. Ireland had no towns, no cities of any kind until the Vikings got there. They did do something for Ireland. But by 1014, they were threatening to take over the whole country, forming alliances, and becoming a major threat to overwhelm the native Irish. And into that situation comes the first and only High King of Ireland, King Brian Gru, whose palace was in what is now the Rock of Cashel up there, and put together an army and marched it from Cashel over to just north of Dublin to the beaches of Clontar. And lifelong learning people, he was 73 or possibly 93 when he led that army to victory at Clontar. And he saved Ireland for the Irish. Without Brian Maru and this victory, the Irish would be speaking Norwegian today, <laughs> um, perhaps. Here is a very, very famous tune celebrating this great march, this great victory, Good Friday, 1014, called The March of Brian Maru.
time was 73, he got tired during the battle and he returned to his tent and there he died. Uh, it was a great victory for the Irish, it was not a great victory for Brian Gru, who lost his life there, killed at the end of the battle by a Viking fleeing the battle there. But his name lives on, if you've been to Trinity Museum there, uh, the Brian Gru Harp is again, like the Book of Kells, one of those great artifacts of Irish history. Uh, quick quiz, what is the national emblem of Ireland? Is it the harp? Is it the shillelagh? The Celtic cross or the shamrock? All associated with Irish culture. There, if you're not familiar with shillelaghs, that's what you beat people on when you're at mighty nice little platform club there. Someone up here had the answer? Heart, heart. It's the heart, absolutely, yeah. Yes. Oh. The, the, oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> Shamrock's the national flower to the people, to the surprise of many people. It's the heart that is the national emblem of heart. And there are 206 countries in the world. Stuff you learn at all alive, just amazing. <laughs> and only one of them has a musical instrument for its emblem. And it shows up on the coins and flags and passports and stamps and everywhere else. Here is the most incredible piece of trivia you will hear all week. I guarantee you. Here. Why does Ireland's National Emblem Park face left? <laughs> is it because Harpers prefer to face left because yes. Ireland is politically liberal? Can a Shmere Emblem faces right or Brian Maru was left handed? <laughs> C. 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 It's <laughs> Guinness was smart enough to patent its right facing Harp and to the amazement of Irish administrators, they said, what the heck, you mean we can't have our heart face right? And he said, that's right. Uh, so there it is. Uh, turning point number three, the Norman invasion of Ireland in 1169. If you remember your history, which a lot of members always do, uh, William the Conqueror comes across from Normandy, 1066, that famous date, and conquers. Uh, England crushes the Anglo-Saxons all. Uh, 104 years later or something, an Irish chieftain named Strongbow gets invited in to Ireland. All the dumb things to do. German Kinkmarrow had stolen away from the neighboring chieftain. The chieftain was not happy about that, and he came and he essentially wiped out German Kinkmarrow's uh, little tribe. And so German Kinkmarrow runs across to England and finds this feudal lord there named Strongbow the Earl of Fitzgerald, and uh, says, give me a hand, bring him in over, I've got to get my kingdom back. Strongbow comes back in 1171, does exactly that, and as a reward for helping the Irish chieftain, he is rewarded with the chieftain's daughter, gets to marry her with the agreement that he will inherit the kingdom uh, when he dies, which he then does very suddenly and inexplicably. <laughs> <laughs> there may be a story. At any rate, again, if you've been to the great to the Irish National Gallery, you've seen the most famous painting there called The Marriage of Strongbow and Aoife, Aoife, the daughter of the Irish chieftain. There, there is a full-size um, picture of the marriage of Aoife and Strongbow, a famous turning point in Irish History. In the center, of course, is Strongbow and Aoife, and then the lower left-hand side <laughs> are the local Irish weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and rigging strings in their harp over their grief. This seems like this is going to be the end. Uh, the Vikings couldn't do it, but here are the powerful Normans. Uh oh they are going to take over Ireland, and it looks like they are going to do that for a while. They gain land and they build stone castles. They bring over the technology for stone castles. The Celts had wood castles. And they gain power and they take over much of Ireland. In just 50 years, you can see they moved from the blue here to the blue all over there. Uh-oh, the Normans are going to take
taking over. This is bad. But incredibly, they assimilate. Instead of the Normans taking, instead of the Irish becoming Norman, the Normans become Irish. They intermarry, they learn Irish language, they take on Irish culture, and in the famous phrase, they become more Irish than the Irish. And uh, any of you with names like any of those, there, those are perfectly Irish names. Uh, the Murphys go back, way, way back to the Celts, but people with famous names like James Joyce, who is certainly very, very Irish, these are, in the background, Northern names. The Harpeth's maiden name there was Payne, and that's originally <laughs> a Norman name. She was a nurse. Can you think of a worse name? Irish and Norman Irish chieftains then ruled throughout Ireland independently until 1540s. Technically, Ireland is all of those Norman princes who came over had sworn fealty to the king, but the king doesn't give a hoot. Uh, Ireland is just that place out there, and he's got other things. But nothing happens for hundreds, 400 years. The Irish rule independently, except the Irish, I'm mean, sorry, the English keep an administrative head in what is called the pale. If you've heard that phrase, beyond the pale, this is where it comes from. That was the original English territory in the island of Ireland that the King of England controlled. And it was the only part he had any power over. Everywhere else was Irish. And so we have the great age of stone castle building as the native Irish people build castles to protect themselves from the Normans, and the Normans build stone castles to protect themselves uh, from the Irish. And Ireland becomes filled with 3,000 castles in Ireland. If you've always wondered how many bars there were in Wisconsin, twice the same. Ireland's got far more castles. <laughs> and with all of those castles, Irish hunters have it made. They are the great entertainers. And they go from castle to castle to castle, entertaining the people in the castle as highly valued entertainers. And much of their work, of course, has been lost. But around 1700, Turlock of Carolyn, Ireland's most famous harpist, uh, kept the records for hundreds and hundreds of harp tunes, 214 of those harp tunes still survive. And we have a harpist in the Celtic concert, so we're going to play famous O'Carolan harp tune called, unfortunately, Fanny Power. It sounds something like a <laughs> But in fact, uh, Fanny Power was the lady of Powers Court, the great castle in um, Ireland, and this is um, Turlock O'Carroll's thank you note to her. He's been there for a week, he's played, he's entertained them, the bed was soft, the food was good, the servants were very, very nice. So instead of writing a thank you note, he writes what he called a little plank a little plucking for them. And he calls it after. Here's Fanny Power with some photos of castles. There are 53 castles for sale in Ireland at this moment. <laughs> so if you this is your moment to move. <laughs> Here's Fanny Power.
Ireland? It starts with me. I was hoping you'd say Bunready because if you've ever been to Bunready, it should be the most popular castle in Ireland. It is the most fun, the most famous entertainment. It's been redecorated. It's got food. It's got purpose. It's got everything. But you're right. It's not Bunready. It's Barney, the no, famous castle. Oh, Why do they visit there? It's just the Barney Stone, yes. Yeah. And all kinds of people go there to get the gift of elegance and persuasiveness and get the gab, thinking they're just going to bend over and kiss the stone that will <laughs> something like that on the picture. They do not realize that the Barney Stone is up on the battlement wall up there. Historically, the great way to get the party stone is it's on the hanging over the outside edge. Now they, you kiss the inside of the Blarney stone, but to get up there, you climb 127 steep spiral steps to a dark dang. In order to get there, you stand in line, depending on the time of the year, from 30 minutes to two hours, we need to do this. And you do a very awkward back then to get into position, and uh, then you kiss the stone, and you keep thinking about the fact that 500,000 visitors have been there before you. And then you go down the back stairs, carefully avoiding the back dead rat at the bottom. And then you stop at the gift shop and buy a, an official certificate and a t-shirt to prove that you uh, kissed the learning story. Um, <laughs> they're trying very hard to turn, bring back the um, As you might suspect, after seven trips there with students who were dying to kiss the Blarney Stone, it was not high on my list of <laughs> places to visit. But they have wonderful botanical gardens. It's a great place to visit. Skip the stone, enjoy the grounds. Uh, Turning point number four, 1534, Henry VIII takes ownership of all of Ireland. Think about that. He simply declares, oh, as of today, all of Ireland belongs to me. I'm king of England. How could he possibly do that? He could do that because back in 1155, in the whole history of the Vatican, 2,000 years of popes, there has been one pope who is English by birth, rather than Italian or Polish or whatever, all those other popes. And that pope issued a papal bull granting England hereditary possession of all of Ireland. Back then, the pope apparently owned everything. And he just gave this to the king of England at the time and said, you've got to take over, um, take over Ireland because they're celebrating Easter on the wrong day and they're not tithing. Uh, no. But nothing happens at that point, but 400 years later, uh, Henry VIII cashes in this chip. Instantly, if you've always wondered why a papal bull was called a papal bull, uh, it's because it's always sealed with a lead seal uh, at the bottom that looks something like that. And the Italian word for seal is bull. Uh, so that's where that comes from. So having it's declared that he, the reason he does this is because he's got the Mary Ann Boleyn who is pregnant with what he hopes is a son who will inherit the kingdom and the Pope has refused the divorce for political reasons. So now, here is a great, truly great turning point in Irish history. Ireland is now absolutely important. Ireland has been ignored by England for all of these years since the Pope gave it away. All of these blue countries are Catholic, including Spain and France, the most powerful countries in the world, and they are Catholic. And now suddenly, here is England, which has become Protestant. Uh, and Ireland then, for if you're a Catholic country, you're looking at it as the great staging area to attack England. It is England's back door. Uh, some of you may remember 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Suddenly, JFK gets very excited because the Russians had moved nuclear missiles into Cuba, which is 100 miles from Florida. Uh, suddenly now, Henry VIII has the same feeling about having Ireland Catholic and England remaining Catholic. 
And so from 1535 on, England does everything possible to stamp on Irish religion, Irish language, Irish culture. And what happens in Ireland is kind of what happens with the Native Americans uh, here in America. They get pushed aside and pushed onto the worst land. And for the next 300 years, uh, English kings plant Ireland. They send planters over. They simply pick someone they want to support and say, oh, here, I'm giving you 60,000 acres of Irish land here on the map here. Here's 100,000 acres of Irish land. The Irish, native Irish, are pushed back further and further into Cormac, the famous military leader, English military leader, Oliver Cromwell, who has famous statements to the Irish natives, you can go to Connaught, you can go to hell or Connaught. There's not much difference. It's the worst. It's like Indians being sent to Wyoming. Um, the native Irish pushed off of Ireland, and penal laws uh, imposed upon them. There are dozens and dozens of penal laws. I just listed a dozen or so. Irish were forbidden to do all but one of these. Which one was allowed? Could they own land, educate their children, attend mass, speak English, travel abroad, own a weapon, join the military, hold public office, own a horse worth more than five pounds, or play Irish music? Speak English? Speak English. Right. Speak English, obviously. I mean, I mean, if you were an Irishman who owned a horse worth more than five pounds, any Protestant could come up to you along the road there and say, here's five pounds, I'll take that horse. And off and go. Think about a country like that. And the most incredible one I've always thought, no Irish music, especially the harp. Queen Elizabeth I, in her very famous statement, hang all the harpers and burn their harp, crushing all. Irish culture. We want to turn Ireland into West Britain, in effect. Even the traditional Irish haircut was banned. It's called the Coolin, and long hair locks traditionally worn by Irish warriors. Here's a very famous poem by a very famous poet, Thomas Moore, National Poet of Ireland, called the Coolin. It describes two Irish lovers who leave Ireland and sail off into exile rather than give up their Irish hairstyle and the heart. So our last glimpse of Aaron and with sorrow I see, yet wherever thou art, shall seem Aaron to me. In exile thy bosom shall still be my home, and thine eyes make my kind. To the gloom of some desert, to cold and rocky shore, where the eye of the stranger can haunt us no more, I will flee with my colon and think the rough wind less fierce than the hole we leave frowning behind. And I'll gaze on thy gold hair as graceful it breathes, and hang o'er thy soft heart as wildly it breathes. And nor fear that the cold-hearted Saxon will tear one string from that heart or one lock from that hair. And turning point number five, 1689, 1691, the deposed Catholic King of England, James II, loses three decisive defeats. If you remember English history again, 1688, uh, England kicks its closet, uh, the king off its throne, turned out to be a closet Catholic, and when he gives birth to his, when his wife gives birth to his son, they said, that's it, you're gone, you're out of here, and they bring in his Protestant uh, sister, Mary Stuart, and her Protestant husband, Prince William of Orange, as king. James II is trying to regain his throne. He runs off first to France and then to Ireland, raises a huge army in Ireland, and sets off to free Ireland from the English, and then going, plans to go back to England and take things over. But that doesn't work out. He loses three very famous 
Battle of the Siege of Derry, the Battle of the Boyne, and the Battle of Ongram, all in Ireland, all of them famous for different things. Siege of Derry was a walled city. The city leaders faced with this giant army, James II said, we give up, okay, open up the gates, we're gonna surrender, and a small group of apprentice boys, known as the Protestant boys now, said, no way, we're not going to surrender. They slammed the city gates and hold out for three long months. The siege is a great failure. And the Protestant boys live on in a famous song. The Protestant boys are loyal and true, so hearted in battle and stark handed too, where cannons were flashing and sables were clashing, the Protestant boys still carried the day. And the second famous battle, the Battle of Boyne, July 11th. Remember that date, 1690? Uh, it was the last battle ever fought in which the two leaders, the two kings, in effect, were on the battlefield. There is James II on his horse. Here is William of England and King William on his horse. Each of them had, I think, James had 27,000 army that he was trying to conduct, and William had 37,000 over here on the other side of the plane. And it's a father-in-law facing his son-in-law over this immense battle of 67,000 troops. And the battle was going okay for both sides, and then suddenly James, for inexplicable reasons, leaves the battlefield, goes back to Dublin, and takes off and goes to back to Europe and never heard of them again. James lives on in Irish history as Seamus on Shaka, James the Pope, uh, <laughs> for his action on the battlefield. And then the Battle of Ogram, another terrible defeat, 4,000 dead Irish left unburied for months and months and months on the battlefield after this crushing defeat. But the dates of that battle, July 11th and July 12th, the two last battles, become the great major holiday in Northern Ireland. If you ever want to see something you've never seen in your life, go to Northern Ireland on July 11th or 12th, or what's called the Glorious 12th. Here on the July 11th, there are bonfires, the likes of which you have never seen anywhere else building these giant pallet fires uh, that tall and parades during the day. The tallest bonfire last year was clocked at 202 feet. I think that's about the same height as Coffin Liger. You can imagine a bonfire that scale in Northern Ireland celebrating these great victories in uh, 1699. From that time on, because King William Orange, Orange was part of the Netherlands, it's like Brown County, it's Orange County. Uh, uh, orange becomes the color associated with Protestant Northern Ireland, and it's a very, very strong anti-Catholic attitude. And if you think our country is polarized between Republicans, Republicans, and Democrats, think of Ireland back then with Protestants and Catholics. And this wonderful song captures that very well. It's called the Old Orange Flute. And it's a reminder of the long-lasting tensions between Protestants and Catholics.
chapel on Sunday to atone for past deeds. He'd say, Pater and Aves and counted his beads. Till after some time at the priest's song desire, he went with that old flute to play in the mass. Well, he offered the old flute to play in the mass, but the instrument shivered and sighed, oh, alas. And lo, as he would, though it made a great noise, Some other sound when he tried it again and played Cropsey's Lie Down. Now, for all he could whistle and finger and blow, to play Apis music, he found it no go. He to poke the boy water, it really would sound. What Apis we in it could not be found.
Irish song with lyrics written by an English lawyer who never set foot in Ireland. When I took students back in the 70s, 80s, 90s to Ireland, um, they would go into pubs and there'd be a session in groups like this and they would go up and ask for Danny Boy and the bands would simply say, never heard of it, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, because for them it was a British tune. And, but if you went up and asked for the song from, for the air from Coney Derry, then they would break into Danny Boy and our students would then sing along with them because the tune is ancient Irish, but the words are modern British uh, air. And you want to be sure to ask for the air from County Derry, County Derry when you go up there. Do not ask for Derry air. Uh, <laughs> it's very confused. And met some other words there. Air from County Derry, but secret. That was the worst post in Wisconsin ever came. <laughs> Turning point number seven, 1845 to 1849, what the Irish call Anne Gorta Moore, the Great Hunger. In England and I think in America they call it the Potato Famine. But in Ireland it is not a famine, it is a hunger because there was food in Ireland as everybody was starving uh, to death. In 1800 to 1850, a third of the population was almost entirely dependent on the potato for food. But they ate potatoes and buttermilk, and uh, that was about it. How many pounds of potatoes per day did the average adult Irish man, working man, eat in 1844? Three, five, or 10 pounds? Per day. It's a trick question in class. Actually, it was 12 or 14 pounds. They were out there laboring in the fields, and all they had to eat. Okay. My mic on, my hearing aid. As I said, I'm deaf. I have no idea if you're hearing me or not. Get up and leave. <laughs> okay. 1845, 1849, the potato crop is wiped out by a potato blight, a fungus there. Millions suffered from hunger. Tenant farmers couldn't pay rent and were evicted. Cottages were turned down, were torn down to make sure the tenants couldn't return. The workhouses filled up. And they're greedy grounds for diseases that killed thousands. 1.4 million is the best estimate of those who died, usually of starvation or disease, which spread throughout Ireland. Something like 2 million Irish emigrated, including shortly after that the Murphys who came to America. Whole towns <coughs> disappeared. And the most maddening thing to the Irish throughout the famine. Irish grain and cattle continued to be exported to England. As one journalist noted at the time, uh, God might have caused the blight, but the Irish caused the famine. Uh, thousands of men were deported to Australia for stealing food to feed the families sent off to the penal colony in Botany Bay. The man in charge of all of this mess in England at the time was Sir Charles Trevelyan, who was knighted for his efforts uh, because he was in charge of providing famine relief to Ireland. And his firm belief was that the famine in Ireland is an effective mechanism for reducing surplus population. And it was the judgment of God. Let them start. Here is a very famous early modern song called The Fields of Math and Dry. If you know the chorus, please join in. We need all the help we can get. <laughs> Oh. 
Turning point number eight, the Great East Rising of 1916, the most famous date in Irish history. On Easter Monday in 1916, a small group of Irish rebels, nationalists, hoping to get all of Ireland together and under their own leadership, took over the GPO, the General Post Office in Dublin, and proclaimed Ireland a republic. This is like Washington and Jefferson getting out there with the Constitution and saying, this is our new republic here. And the rebellion is called the Easter Rising because it's supposed to occur on Easter, uh, and it was supposed to pick up the symbolism of Easter. Here is the resurrection of a whole new free uh, Ireland. The Irish are always late, didn't quite work out that way, and the message got diluted ended up on Easter Monday instead. The rebel leaders made two incredible assumptions, that England would not show Dublin. This is the second greatest city in the British Empire. London and Dublin are those glorious cities. And remember the Act of Union. Ireland is part of England now. They are united. It's a united kingdom. And they assume that throughout the whole country, the Irish people would rise up and support this rebellion. Uh, in Ireland. But remember, this is 1916. What happened in 1914? World War One began and continued year after year after year. And the Irish men went off and fought for the British <coughs> in World War One because it was a job and they needed a job to survive. So here we have all these Irish women uh, with sons over fighting in Europe. And here are these guys standing around in Dublin saying, support us as we kill English. Mike, your battery might have died. <laughs> it's showing red. I think So here is the, uh, both of those claims, of course, turned out to be wrong. Uh, the British got sailed a gunboat up the Liffey River and shelled Dublin to the great surprise of the rebels. And the rebellion got absolutely no public support because World War I was going on. The rebellion started on Monday, rebels surrendered on Friday. This was a one week long rebellion and they were taken to Kilmaine in jail. Fourteen leaders were quickly executed within the next two weeks, including one of them named Joseph Plunkett, who lives on in a wonderful song about his two great loves, Ireland and Grace Gifford. Uh, he was 28 years old. He had written a whole bunch of religious poetry, including one called uh, Blood Across the Roads, around the road, and he was one of the leaders of the rebellion. He was a strategic thinker, and he planned to marry Grace Gifford originally on Easter Sunday. Uh, the rebellion screwed that up in two ways. Partly he got very, very sick. He had tuberculosis and had been operated on that week. He had to postpone the wedding, and then they announced a rebellion for Easter Sunday. So he left his sick bed and joined the Easter Rising on Monday morning and was right there in the post office. Like all the other leaders, he was captured, sentenced to be executed, but he finessed a marriage to Grace Gifford before he was taken home and shot. Here is a wonderful song called Grace about Joseph Plunkett and his two great loves. <laughs> As we gather in the chapel here in Old Main of Jail, I think about these past few weeks, or will they say we fail? From our school days, they have told us we 
dead batteries back yeah. here. <laughs> Don't talk about the membership that way. <laughs> Let's do more of the green. See, rising, failed, 
Executions led to widespread popular support after the end of World War I. Everybody then, from the time on, that Ireland was shocked by all of the executions. Uh, but there was nothing then they could do about it at the time. After the war ended, suddenly then, uh, they started the great Irish War of Independence, two-year war with the, what had begun, what had begun as the Irish Brotherhood uh, became the Irish Republican Army against a uh, very mixed bag of British troops sent over to put them down. But the War of Independence then ended in the Act of Partition, 1921, uh, with Northern Ireland very carefully gerrymandered to make sure there would be more Protestants than Catholics up there, uh, with the agreement that they would stay united to the United Kingdom until they voted to join uh, Southern Ireland. And Southern Ireland got home to rule and eventually uh, a republic. It was a very messy agreement, hotly contested. Nobody was greatly happy because the Southern Irish wanted to have all of Ireland united, uh, and Northern Ireland didn't want Southern Ireland to have anything. So it all ended. But for 75 years, they muddled along with that agreement until uh, with Northern Ireland essentially being like the South after the Civil War, uh, with the Catholics being treated like blacks in the South. There was great segregation and discrimination because the Catholics were a minority in Northern Ireland and uh, everything was in the <coughs> United Kingdom. Housing jobs, treatment by police, all was based on religion for 75 years. Then if you remember the 60s in America, civil rights, Ronald Reagan and all of that, suddenly the Irish got a message, maybe we can change things here if we Catholics get together and hold peace marches. And this then brings us to turning point number nine, the troubles, a famous phrase in Northern Ireland. For 30 years, guerrilla warfare back and forth between the Protestants and the Catholics, a variety of paramilitary factions. It began the peaceful civil rights marches, and then it escalated into bombings and assassinations by both sides, and the British Army was then called in to restore peace, but it was pretty clear they were not a neutral force. Uh, they were on the side of the Protestants. And uh, thanks to have a hand for school board. <laughs> The IRA retaliated for those bombings by going back, going into England and setting up bombs there. This is a terrible terrorist actions on both sides. The Protestants retaliated with bombings in Southern Ireland. That's 1974. I was there with a group of students in Dublin two days before that bomb. And all the bombs were gone by the time the bomb did go on. Wikipedia lists 52 Irish songs of the troubles. This is how serious this was. And the band is now going to play all 50 no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Out of all these wonderful songs that they could have played, uh, the uh, Warren player picked Phil Coulter's The Town I Love So Well, which I think is fabulous music. Here is The Town I Love So Well. With photos of the top. Oh, they can't send it all. What's your problem? I'm sure I'll call them. Those are happy 
May the Lord rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again,